Welcome to Peerpoint Perspectives, the securities finance podcast delivering commentary from the best, brightest and most innovative people in the world of securities lending, repo, collateral management and related areas. Peerpoint Perspectives is brought to you by the consulting team at Peerpoint Financial. So now over to your hosts. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of Peerpoint Perspectives, The Art of Securities Finance. I'm your host, Roy Zimmerhansel, and practice lead at Peerpoint. Now, many people will know that I've been focused on securities lending and ESG for some time now, and there are seemingly a proliferation of ESG initiatives as it's taking hold of investors' attention. I think we've been writing blog posts on it for about a year, um, and my own engagement with it goes, uh, goes prior to that. Of course, at the heart of securities lending business is the demand to borrow securities generally, but not always driven by short selling. Uh, so it seems to me that the start of any discussion has to include an analysis of short selling and responsible investment. And that's what my guest is going to talk about today. That guest is Max Boudra. Max is an associate on the Markets, Governance and Innovation team at AMA, the Alternative Investment Management Association, where he specializes in the implementation of responsible investment. Working with alternative investment managers, investors and investment consultants, Max has written a series of guides on responsible investment and alternative investment management, most recently on the use of short selling to hedge against ESG risks. And it was really that uh, writing that Max has done in the past that uh, encouraged us to uh, reach out to him, uh, I guess, earlier this year. Uh, And uh, subsequently, as different papers have been released, we've kind of stayed in touch. So prior to joining AMA, Max worked in strategy consulting in London, and he's an, an alumnus of the London School of Economics and Political Science. But of course, far more important than his professional qualifications and academic achievements is the fact that Max is Canadian. So that's enough of me talking on my own. Let's get to it. So good morning, Max, and thanks very much for joining me. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So Max, why don't we start with what you're responsible for at AMA? Yes. Um, so I guess maybe it would be helpful to start with what AIM is to begin with. AIM is the global representative body for the hedge fund industry, right? So AIM stands for the Alternative Investment Management Association. Uh, despite that kind of broad remit that would be implied in the title, we really only look after hedge funds. And then we have an affiliate called the Alternative Credit Council that does private credit. And then this is all around the world. You know, We have offices everywhere from DC to uh, Tokyo, obviously headquartered here in London. And within AMA, I work on what's called the Markets Governance and Innovation Team. And then specifically within that, and the reason I'm probably here on this podcast now is that I look after a lot of our kind of sound practice guide and thought leadership around what responsible investment means for the hedge fund industry. Right. So actually, in prep for this, when I was looking at the website, obviously, there was the paper that that I've seen before, but there's there's a a, I was surprised at the broad array of kind of best practice papers that are freely available on the site. Right. Uh, Well, yes, no. Right. So uh, a lot of our guides are available uh, only for members. So if you are interested in membership, please do get in contact with the AMA membership team. Uh, But we also have a a fair amount of research and kind of communication that's made broadly publicly available. Um, So obviously, we work just not not just on sound practice, but also on research into the industry and the benefits it gives to investors. And then also, uh, as you can probably imagine, regulatory engagements with massive component of our work as well. So all that information is available on our website. And the paper that we're going to be specifically talking about today was uh, released, um, uh, I guess, in the summer and in conjunction with Simmons and Simmons, and it was entitled Short Selling and Responsible Investment. <clears throat> so uh, look, that that's what we're going to be talking about. But let's let's put this in context. I, I read a, a recent EY report that said, amongst other things, that 49 percent of investors surveyed are now looking at ESG projects 
and that the figures doubled in the past year. So, and in that same report, 70% of investors believe that an alternative manager's internally SG policy is critically important. So is, is that, is that why, um, why AMA had a look at this? Is it sort of in reflection to what the managers want you to do? Or do you, have you spotted this as a key investor trend and, and you're trying to be ahead of the curve? That's a good question. I mean, I don't think those things are uh, two things are necessarily exclusive, right? So historically, I think when you say ESG or responsible investment, a lot of people thought you just meant kind of screens, right? And that was generally not seen as something that hedge funds generally do or should do. And uh, even going back just two years ago, there were still questions over whether that was compatible with fiduciary duty. I think there's been an evolution in understanding of responsible investment. So managers are increasingly understanding that a lot of it, and we, when we say responsible investment, we're talking particularly about ESG integration, a lot of that's effectively enhanced investment due diligence or risk management. Uh, and a lot of it, frankly, they already did to begin with. And then at the same time, as you said, yes, investors are becoming, I think, uh, considerably more interesting. And there's been a kind of, I, I guess, a, if not a paradigm shift, then something close to that in importance where I think people are increasingly realizing that these things can be accounted for in investment, that it's not unusual to expect that, say, your investments match your ethical beliefs or take into account climate change or that kind of thing. So it's a combination of, I think, growing awareness of the potential utility, at least for some strategies, uh, by a lot of people in our industry, and then, of course, investor interest. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're in financial services, so investors get what they want, right? And then I guess the, the other thing would be uh, regulatory interest in this as well, but that's for now mostly confined to the European Union. Yeah, and, and Europe uh, clearly seems to be leading the way in terms of regulation on this. And and unlike some of the regulations which I talk about, you know, to me, I think that's actually a good thing for Europe to be leading on. So uh, so we'll see if the rest of the world follows. Now, I've, I've lumped ESG and responsible investing kind of together as if they're the one, one thing. But, but, you know, in your opinion, are, are they really? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So anytime you deal with these issues, there's a huge amount of kind of terminological morass, right? Uh, I, the first paper we put out on responsible investment was a responsible investment primer, and it basically just tried to get people to use the same terms to refer to the same things. I'm still not entirely successful, I think, even within AMA. Uh, but officially, we see, uh, and we take this from PRI, actually, we see responsible investment is kind of a catch-all umbrella term for the integration of non-financial factors and information into the investment management process and risk management process. And then within that, ESG is one form of responsible investment. And ESG, is, I'm sure the listeners will know, is environmental, social, and governance factors. So that's integrating the consideration of those factors, which we're not traditionally seen as material to the investment process into everything from portfolio construction to asset selection to risk management, uh, all that. Um, so when we're talking specifically in the context of short selling, we're normally talking about ESG operation and not the other kind of responsible investment things like just screening out assets. I think that's, that's more clear now. Um, and one of the things that I've heard many concerns about is the lack of standard agreements or or consistent terminology or definitions. Um, and in some cases, I hear people saying that they look they're going to wait until there are sort of commonly accepted um, uh, terms of reference for this before really proceeding down the road much further. Is is that kind of uncertainty? Is that having any impact in the alternative space? I mean, it, it's a good question, right? So when we say standardization, one of the problems is, and this isn't, I mean, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but what you have to keep in mind is that responsible investment really does mean different things to different investors, right? 
the priorities, if you if we talk about ESG integration, different investors will have different priorities when it comes to environmental, social, and governance factors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so one of the cliches, and it's not always true, but a lot of people say, you know, North American investors tend to focus much more on social aspects like diversity and inclusion, whereas European investors tend to focus more on the environment. So the problem is, if you create just a single standard for responsible investment means taking X, Y, Z criteria into account, you may actually lose a lot of kind of investor nuance around that. So I don't necessarily see it as a problem. Obviously, it's it's a bit difficult that no one, everyone uses these terms and no one's referring to the same thing. But again, we come back to, I think in some ways our industry has it easier because we're not generally serving commercial clients. Uh, so hedge funds tend to know their investors very well and know what they expect. So you wouldn't necessarily give the same responsible investment solution to every single investor, right? They might have different expectations. Right. And in my own discussions with investors, the relative importance of the of the E, S, and G uh, changes by investor as well. So it's very much a, yeah. in experience, a, a, an individual choice and prioritization. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so let's look at the report now. There are kind of two aspects to it. One is the uh, influence that activist investors have on the companies uh, that are in play. And the other of it, part is the use of, of, of this as part of portfolio hedging, which I found really fascinating because the truth is I've been thinking about these issues for a while. And because I'm not looking at the investment side of it, I hadn't even considered that before. So can you describe maybe how short selling can be used um, as a hedge against potential ESG risks and just take it through that process? Yeah, um, so it might be worth taking a step back, right? And, and to go back to the question about what investors expect from responsible investment in ESG, one thing you have to keep in mind is that the actual goals are different too, right? Not just the priorities on ESG, but also what they hope to accomplish by implementing ESG or getting their external managers to do so. And a lot of ESG integration, I would say the majority of ESG integration in the hedge fund industry is actually about risk management, right? It's about figuring out how to limit your undesired risk uh, exposure to environmental, social, and governance factors. And then obviously... I mean, given the industry that we are, if you're looking at how do I hedge out these, in many cases, systemic factors, short selling is the obvious response if you're a hedge fund, right? Uh, so the paper, and I'd like to thank Simmons for sponsoring the paper, and we had a really excellent group of managers who I won't list here because I might forget one and that would be embarrassing. But if you do go on the AMO website, this paper is publicly available and you can see the list of managers who really drove the paper forward. Uh, the idea is that you could theoretically use short positions to hedge against, we use the example of carbon exposure, right? So there's a, a concept that the PRI has been promulgating called the inevitable policy response. I think maybe describing anything as inevitable is a, is a bit uh, deterministic. But the there is, I think, a growing awareness that exposure to carbon represents a risk. Uh, primarily a regulatory risk. We've seen jurisdictions around the world implement carbon taxes, and it's not unreasonable to want to hedge against that risk, right, if you're concerned about minimizing risk to your portfolio. So the idea would be uh, for a hedge fund, if you had you know, a high carbon intensity on your long side, that you could also invest in companies with a, you know, a higher carbon intensity on the short side, and thereby effectively hedge out a lot of your carbon risk to minimize the effects that any kind of regulatory response would have. So it's kind of like, this, so an investor, you know, at, at the starting point can have a portfolio constructed to achieve its sort of general investing goals and then decide that it wants to reduce its carbon in this example, and then can deploy some of these short strategies to uh, reduce their overall portfolio exposure. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, you know, it, it's just like hedging on market risk, right? Except we're talking about carbon exposure rather than beta. Uh, 
And yes, I mean, theoretically, you could even create a portfolio that was short carbon, right? If you genuinely think that companies with particularly high carbon intensity and in the paper we use uh, the TCFDs, you know, metrics for measuring uh, carbon intensity. But if you think those companies are particularly vulnerable, and yeah, I think a lot of people would argue that there are good reasons to think that, you could theoretically construct a portfolio that was short carbon. Right. And the other interesting application are sort of long short funds that, that focus within the ESG space. So again, you know, one of the one of the challenges of, of just exclusion is that investors don't get the opportunity to benefit from uh, the upside from companies within challenged industries that are that are trying to to have a greener future, if if you will. Uh, and, while at the same time um, managing the, the the exposures or taking advantage of their belief that you know, say carbon as an example, uh, will will. So so th- there's been a big sort of movement into these sorts of ESG funds as well. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that's worth mentioning when we talk about short selling and ESG integration. Uh, we are aware as an industry that there's been some skepticism around whether short selling is even compatible with the notion of responsible investment at all. Um, you know, we think it is for the obvious reason that you can use it to hedge against these risks and use it to create an impact, which I'm sure we'll get on to talking about. Uh, but one thing I think people should be aware of, and again, to go back to this question of what investors expect when they ask for responsible investment Different investors will have a different opinion on shorting screened assets too, right? So some investors I know will be fine if a manager shorts, you know, tobacco industry, right? Um, for, for a variety of reasons, well, as, uh, you know, some other investors won't be happy even if the only exposure to say tobacco or what have you is on the short side because they take the stance, an ethical stance, that they don't want to drive any profit from these industries. So it's another nuance that I think the industry has to be aware of and it's not really caught in the kind of broader debates around standards. Yeah, that's that's an interesting example. Really, just trying to have nothing to do with the industry at all. Um, I that, but you know, I have seen two uh, portfolio managers, both managing um, ESG ETFs, mm-hmm. debate um, Facebook as an example, where one says, "Yeah, it, we we count that as a, as an eligible security to be long because." Um, you know, it, it has no impact on the environment. It's it's just a sort of a networking site or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. The other one said, well, yeah, but we, we definitely uh, think that it's part of the assessment process because if you think of all the energy that needs to be produced in order to allow people to access Facebook and, you know, mm-hmm. you have billions of people accessing it, if that's not green energy, it actually has a, a, a negative impact. So So we don't want to... Uh, be long Facebook, mm-hmm. so so it's interesting these sorts of uh, debates and perspectives. And is that is that kind of what what was part of the discussion in terms of of, of trying to draw parameters around what qualifies G or responsible investing and shorting, and it must be part of that whole discussion. Yeah, and again, it comes back to the investor, it comes back to the manager, right? Um, so. <laughs> What you also have to keep in mind is not just investor preference, but it's also manager strategy, right? And one thing I think hedge funds struggle with when it comes to responsible investment or one challenge they face is that for some strategies, it's not immediately clear how you ever even integrate ESG, right? So there are a lot of quantitative funds that actually do really interesting stuff around ESG integration. Uh, But if you were to kind of think off the top of your head, a lot of environmental risks manifest over the medium to long term, right? And if you're a high frequency trader, uh, you know, you might not be as concerned about that for each position. So the way you actually go about integrating ESG and thinking about ESG is going to be very, very different them from, say, a more traditional long, short uh, discretionary fund. And then obviously that would be much more different from, you know, a traditional long only firm where you have, I would argue, kind of less uh, less uh, ability to manage some of these risks than you would on the hedge side. Yeah, so time frame uh, affects 
your approach and, uh, and response to that. And so that's interesting because one of the one of the questions that uh, people are always checking now is are these portfolios really good if you just look at the long side so forget about the forget about the side for the moment but do these ESG funds actually outperform or is that just wishful thinking and there's there's all kinds of views on that i've i've seen some figures this year that say yes they're outperforming i've seen other people challenge those to say well yes in theory but that's because a lot of them tend to be very tech heavy and tech uh, has had a good year, so hmm. it's you know the, the it's yet to be proven whether these portfolios really do. Yeah, no, well, exactly. I think the jury's still out. Uh, there's still skepticism in some quarters, but at the end of the day, at least in our industry, when we're talking about ESG integration, we really are talking about ESG factors that are financially material, right? So. From my perspective, I would find it hard to, uh, you know, it's not entirely credible that taking more factors into account, more financially material factors into account would lead to underperformance, if I can put it that way. But again, it depends how it's implemented and how the strategy does it. Now, I will say again, part of this would get lost, especially in our industry, because a lot of managers were already doing all of this. They just did call it ESG, right? If you're trading you know uh, if you're an energy fund right you were probably taking into account debates around climate change and regulation of carbon etc uh, you just wouldn't call yourself an esg fund or necessarily label yourself as doing esg integration so that kind of messes up the um scoring of these two yeah and i guess the ethical element of it has been around for a long time for those mm-hmm. investors that are motivated by those kinds of issues as well and it's it's it, it was kind of a a standalone sort of topic where you would kind of used to call them the vice funds yeah. right so it would be the tobacco alcohol and you know, that kind of segment and this this kind of reframes that right um yes and no right uh, so i think we're kind of talking about two separate things and that is one of the reasons there's been skepticism around responsible investment is that people have thought it just meant the kind of old-fashioned uh vice funds now that's still an element but when we talk about responsible investment we're really talking about esg integration at least in our industry uh, which is not to say that a lot of investment managers don't have screens again just like they might be considering what we would call ESG factors and just not labeling it as such, a lot of managers will have informal screens around certain assets. It might not be written down, but they might just make it, you know, informal choice internally not to invest in certain assets. That's quite common as well. And, you know, the, again, the, an example that came up um, a number of years ago where the bank, uh, probably about two or three years ago, the bank I was, uh, I was working at, uh, made an announcement that they would no longer finance projects, mining projects in um, developed countries. And another uh, uh, bank of sort of similar, perhaps larger size said they just weren't going to finance any mining um, uh, projects at all anywhere, mm-hmm. developing countries uh, or uh, developed countries. And the argument is, well, should developing countries lose out on the employment and the social aspects and economic benefits of, of those projects uh, because they haven't had the opportunity to benefit from it, whereas the developed companies had. So it's those sorts of debates that I think must, uh, you know, must give opportunities, I guess, for funds to differentiate themselves and say, this is the type of approach that we Exactly. And I actually know a couple of funds that work in emerging markets that have really sophisticated, responsible investment policies, right? But obviously, those, if you're investing in, in, say, oil companies in Iraq, you're going to have to have different ESG expectations than if you're investing in oil companies in Norway, right? Um, So it's about kind of finding those nuances and articulating them to investors and, and doing the best, I suppose, that you can. Great. So thanks. So let's let's look at the second part of the paper, which is <clears throat> more about um, the use of of short selling and the ESG, and and so particularly the G side, because that's that's traditionally to me always been the role of of short selling is uh, to keep companies 
on the straight and narrow from a governance perspective. Hmm. And, yeah, exactly. and yeah, that's again one of the things that kind of gets lost in these debates. But hedge funds have always cared very deeply about governance, and as you said, yeah, that's historically been the trigger for probably most of the most well-known kind of um, short campaigns and activist campaigns. And uh, I was listening to something the other day that said the number of campaigns this year has actually been uh, been lower, um, but obviously some some big wins with things like Wirecard and uh, NC Health and uh, hmm. so so it's an interesting time because I guess activist investing uh, is uh, is kind of a, a a fundamental part of the alternative space. Right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, just just to be clear, I think. When we talk about short selling, people instantly go to activists. And I would just like to reiterate that the vast majority of short positions are put on for in a more passive role for risk mitigation. But yes, activism is a, a really important part of the industry. And I think a, a really kind of a unique role that a lot of hedge funds play in the industry is finding out that being incentivized to discover potential uh, governance shortfalls and, and act upon them and thus inform the market about them. Right? Yeah, and I think, thanks for making that point, Max, because, you know, again, most of the audience here um, uh, will have some experience with with sort of the securities m- lending market. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. The overwhelming, overwhelming majority of short positions are uh, part of some other transaction. So it's not just a pure directional um, share price falling because obviously there's a there's that's a, a a very risky strategy. If your only way to profit is if a company goes down and that's a standalone position uh, that has an asymmetric kind of risk profile compared to a, a long short. So, um, so point point well. But it's certainly the one that gets the headlines. <laughs> it is. It's, yes, it's it's probably the sexier of the. T- that def- definitely on the uh, the sexy end of things, although I don't know. Uh, I, I think quite a lot of short sellers would like to think of themselves as sexy. Uh, I don't know how often they get described as sexy. They, I'm, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that comes out specifically in this ESG space is the phrase greenwashing. Yeah. Can you maybe explain what that is and how it manifests itself? Yeah, good question. Uh, greenwashing is kind of the great bugbear of responsible investment, right? Greenwashing is this idea that you would market yourself as being green or responsible or socially responsible when in actual fact you aren't. Um, now, to go back to our, our previous conversation, I think some of the concern around it is probably a bit overblown, at least in our industry. I realize why people would be concerned about it in the retail industry, because there people don't necessarily have the time to you know, investigate, like offering memoranda. So if you're just a retail investor investing in an index fund and the index fund says, we are environmentally sustainable, and then you start going in and the definition of environmental sustainability that that fund is using is different from your understanding of environmental sustainability, then yes, that could be a big problem. For our industry, it's it's a bit different. I would say it's more about making expectations clear with investors. But at the end of the day, uh, most hedge fund investors, uh, I mean, these are some of the most sophisticated investors in the world, right? Uh, some of the largest institutional investors, everything from mass pension funds to sovereign wealth funds are invested in hedge funds. So I think they have a a bit more scope to, you know, do a a fair amount of due diligence and talk to managers about their expectations. So I think it will be hard. Uh, I, I, you know, it it wouldn't be impossible, but I think it would be very hard for a manager in our industry to actually successfully market themselves erroneously as quote unquote green if they weren't actually doing that. Uh, again, I like, I do think it is a concern more on the retail side, more around different expectations. Uh, but I do think sometimes it's, it, the fear is a bit overblown, to be honest. And, and so in fact, wouldn't they, many of these alternative managers be looking at 
company pronouncements to see whether the companies themselves were actually, you know, uh, marketing a better story than they were actually living and having that identified as as short candidates. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a good question. So that's the other element to greenwashing is if you actually go outside the investment management world, uh, which is obviously where I focus, but if you actually start looking at the actual corporates and assets, then yes, that is that is a, a different problem, right? I'm, I, I'm sure... So I, it, 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 I sit on a fair amount of ESG panels and go to a fair amount of ESG events, and it's effectively impossible to attend an event uh, wherein no one complains about the quality of ESG data. But we do it because it's true, right? Uh, issuer disclosures are still not great. Uh, there's not that much regulation in place. Obviously, there's more regulation coming in the EU. Uh, but expectations differ and even kind of re- like really excellent initiatives like the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the, the principles tend to be quite high level, right? So theoretically, if you were an issuer and you were inclined to do so, if you really wanted to attract kind of green capital, you know, it is possible that you could portray yourself as more green than you actually are, especially if you just kind of look at your media operations and then maybe kind of don't disclose your supply chain and, and what happens to your products downstream as well. Um, so that's a concern. Obviously, you know, hedge funds have a, a long history of doing very in-depth research of issuers. Uh, but it is, I think, one area in which regulators and policymakers could be more helpful, right? Because at the end of the day, especially to use the EU as an example, and not that I think other jurisdictions are necessarily going to follow what the EU has done. Uh, But to use the EU as an example, if you're saying investment managers have to take into account X, Y, Z, you know, environmental factors, then it it stands to reason that you also need a foundation of kind of data on which to act. Um, Someone I was speaking with recently who's been in the ESG space for a long time on the alternative side kind of compared modern day ESG data to what financial data would have been a hundred years ago. And I, I think that's probably pretty accurate. You know, there's not a lot of standardization and there's, there's a fair amount of room for um, flexibility, shall we say intentional or otherwise on the part of issuers. But a hundred years ago is when I started working, I think. <laughs> um, one of the things that, um, that, come up is the th- this issue of regulation that we've been talking about and one of my last guest l- last program's guest was more in the ETF space mm-hmm. and one of the interesting things is if it's proven that ESG focused investments uh, generate better returns over time it kind of becomes an inevitability that companies with uh, strong credentials and strong programs that qualify them for for ESG, uh, they will become bigger. Their cost of capital will become uh, lower, and they'll have an advantage over their. Uh, they will uh, have larger stock market capitalization. That means that they'll represent bigger parts of mainstream indices, and therefore, over time, if this is proven. It, it seems likely that in, say, three years, five years, seven years, that a big proportion of uh, indices and therefore ETFs, and because there's so much passive money following ETFs of strategies, uh, including ETFs, that they will become dominant in, in many markets and that perhaps the EU is even trying to encourage this kind of ESG focus in, in index construction. I don't know if you've had any conversations with people along those lines or, or kind of heard. Yeah, it's an interesting proposition, right? So the idea that ESG-friendly companies will become larger, yes. I mean, I think that's plausible, but we have to keep in mind is that that won't happen in a vacuum, right? As Companies that are already ESG friendly today might be attracting more capital, but as they get more capital, the rest of the market will react and and potentially move to also become more ESG friendly, right? So you're already seeing oil companies transition to not being oil companies, but being quote unquote energy companies, right? So that kind of thing is happening. Uh, With the EU regulation, yeah, I mean, so I think there's there's always kind of a, a, a facile differentiation made between 
let's say, Canada and the United States on one hand and Europe on the other. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily helpful. The regulations in each jurisdiction are just trying to do very different things. The European Union is deliberately and, and has made this clear that it's going to try to use private capital and effectively reorient private capital to meet policy goals, right, and, and industrial policy, right? Uh, I believe it's called dirigisme if you're feeling particularly fancy. Um, whereas on the North American side, and when you see this coming on the recent Department of Labor uh, proposals, and I guess one now implemented rule in the United States, it's still more about looking at responsible investment from a mis- risk management perspective and a kind of value maximization perspective on the investment side. So it's two very different things. Uh, and at the end of the day, I don't think we can really talk about the EU regulation without understanding that the end goal is, yes, to, I mean, it, it is officially to reshape the European economy and make it greener. Well, I think you and I can probably agree from a personal point of view that whatever Canada does must be the way forward. Right? It's, uh, it's always the way forward. It's the most righteous way forward. Uh, but that's actually Canada. I mean, a, a patriotic kind of pride aside. Uh, Canada is a really interesting example wherein you have, I think, a fairly strong environmental movement, but also obviously a very strong uh, resource extraction industry and kind of seeing how that plays out will be interesting to see how it will be a good kind of canary in the coal mine for how responsible investment regulation is going forwards, right? Yeah, actually, I remember reading a book when I was a when I was a teenager, and yes, they did have printing presses back then. Right. Um, yeah. And it was about it was about the U.S. annexing Canada because of its uh, its supply of uh, water, uh, you know, fresh water. Yeah. So that may that may yet come. But to it time. could happen. Yeah, I was still waiting for it. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? And, and to stick with the Canadian example, actually, now that we're on at this good example of province of Alberta, which is where you know, most of the oil in Canada comes out of, has recently seen its provincial debt downgraded because obviously the oil industry has not had a particularly good year. And that just kind of goes to show the role that ESG can play in something even like sovereign debt, which has historically not been something, uh, not been an area in which ESG has been really well integrated. You know, I hadn't considered that. That's, a, that's an interesting example. I'm wondering if the same applies, the same kind of scenario to Australia. Um, yeah, so so people have said that there's actually a, um, I think it's like a 22 year old who is suing the government of Australia for not disclosing uh, the potential effects of climate change on their sovereign bonds. So, yeah, no, it's definitely possible. And we would say if you look around the world, the jurisdictions that are highly dependent on industries that could potentially be in for a not particularly brilliant future. I mean, it makes sense to think about these things, especially if you plan on holding those bonds over the medium to long term. Yeah, I want to go back to the point you talked about in terms of the differentiation between uh, kind of uh, more sophisticated investors and uh, retail investors, just just the average person mm-hmm. um, and and the information. Because... You know, I've I've seen a number of funds be released uh, over the last year, and one of them one of them set me off on a rant at the end uh-huh. of last year, where it was an e, an ESG ETF, right. where eighty percent of it was going to track an ESG index, and I'm going, well, hold on, that that means it's a mostly ESG right. ETF, yep. not an ESG one, and then on top of that, it excluded the securities lending collateral, right. so it say at its peak. 20% of the fund was on loan you, and and they get collateral in for that. If that collateral hasn't been filtered for SG, all of a sudden you could have a 60% e- ETF, which a retail investor just is never going to look through and understand that. No, exactly. And and even like simpler than that, what is the definition of an ESG index to begin with, right? Is it just one that screens out certain assets? Because you do see occasionally kind of index funds that are marketed as ESG that basically just exclude the old vice stocks, right? Um, and I, that's a very different proposition than having one that's specifically geared towards you know, investing in specific companies, right? There are positive and negative screens. And how do you kind of reconcile that? So 
I do think that is a big concern, um, especially on the retail side, and I can see a role for regulators. Uh, but again, you know, you've only seen it really in, in the European Union so far. I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I think it's safe to say the current administration in the United States will not use this last couple of months to implement regulation like that. But um, to, uh, for instance, in Canada, does the Canadian government regulate ESG indices and say, look, you can only have a certain exposure to, say, energy companies or mining companies? Uh, and then risk a, a, a fairly large political contretemps over that, right? So it's a tricky kind of needle for policymakers to thread. Yeah, well, look, all of this uncertainty to me seems like it's creating a, a, a excellent environment for ESG oriented. So has it been? Have you seen a growth in in those, or or does AIM attract that kind of information? Yep. Um, so don't track them informally, but one of the nice things about my job is I do get to speak to people who do this. Uh, yes, there are ESG long short funds. Um, I, so I guess to be clear, right? So a lot of funds are kind of just adding ESG to their existing strategy, right? That's the most common thing to do. Uh, the idea of kind of building a long short funds specifically on ESG lines has been done. Uh, it is less common. Um, there are some firms that do with, like pretty cool things actually around investing in, uh, for example, the climate transition, right? So there are firms I know that will invest in kind of companies that they think will do well out of the climate transition. So for instance, companies that provide insulation for homes, that's a kind of classic anytime a policymaker wants to do anything about climate change but doesn't really want to risk any political capital they give tax grants for you know retrofitting homes right so always a great investment there uh, and then on the other side kind of shorting for instance very carbon intensive industries like uh, concrete manufacturing or something like that look i, I think there's a lot uh, a lot to uh, still be um and uh, written and rewritten on this area. So what else is AMA working on in this direction? That's a good question. So uh, working on a lot. I think there's a, there's a fair amount of interest in this. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about our industry is at the end of the day, the hedge fund industry is comparatively very small uh, and very complicated, right? So when kind of overarching standards for this kind of thing do get made, they tend not to get made specifically with hedge funds in mind, right? Just because the kind of cost benefit is not worth the kind of larger standards bodies doing so. Um, so that's that's left a really kind of exciting market gap for AMA to fill, uh, which we've, I mean, that's the reason AMA exists, right? So we have a global responsible investment committee that's made up of some of the kind of leading lights of ESG investing in the hedge fund industry. And we're going to be working on a series of papers, everything from, I think uh, engagement. So how do you engage if you don't have voting rights? How do you engage if you just have kind of synthetic exposure to an asset, to uh, derivatives, to work on private credit and, and uh, covenants and that kind of thing? Uh, so basically everything uh, is, is the short answer. If there is a thing on responsible investment and alternatives, it is on Amos agenda. And anyone who is interested Feel free to go on our website, download the publicly available material we have, uh, get in touch with me. My email and contact details are on the AIMA website, which is just AIMA.org. Um, and get in touch. And if there's anything you would like to see from AIMA, we're always very helpful, uh, very uh, keen to speak with kind of other shareholders in this area. Yeah, and I meant to make this point uh, earlier that the paper that we've been talking about will be available in show notes. So will a link to uh, AMA. Uh, you know, Max, what's the best way for people to reach you? Is that on LinkedIn or what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so my email is mbudra at AMA.org, or you can just uh, add me on LinkedIn. Always happy to talk about these things. Uh, it's a new field. It's an interesting field. So we learn by talking to more people. So feel free, Max Pudra, on LinkedIn to add me. Yeah, and look, uh, I can I can vouch for the fact that you are open to uh, chatting about it. That's how we met. Uh, we we read one of your papers and and got in contact with you, and it was uh, 
it was a good discussion and that's kind of partly how we got to this conversation today so look i i think um i think that with the survey figures and the, the anecdotal stories that you're getting and we certainly know that investors are are interested in the area you, one of the points you touched on uh, a second ago was voting i think we'll definitely be doing an episode on voting in the future so I, mm-hmm. i'd like to Um, but any any other thoughts, uh, sort of closing thoughts um, about sort of AMA or the industry or ESG issues uh, going forward? Uh, good question. I think going forward, you know, people need to know that alternative investment managers, hedge fund managers do take these issues very seriously and the industry is very focused on it and doing some very interesting things. So I would, you know, recommend anyone who is interested in these topics to reach out and speak to people in the industry. I was very happy to talk. Great. So listen, uh, Max, thank you very much. I've learned a lot. So I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure the uh, the audience will as well. And as you said, uh, uh, AIM is open for discussion and input. And, and there's lots of really interesting things to read on your website. All of those links will be in, in the show notes. So Max, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I certainly learned a lot in that one. And some of it comes down to the nuances and the subtleties around the topic of responsible investing, ESG, hedge funds, short selling, the whole sort of gamut. Uh, look, I loved, I loved how Max framed it. You know, investors get what they want. And he pointed to changing investor opinions on the importance of responsible investing and and AIM is really driven by a combination of what investors want and, and them placing growing emphasis on responsible investing and some of the AIM members that are pushing it forward with this topic. So it's really a convergence of the two things. Uh, he, Max pointed to uh, different investors having different priorities. And the example I think that he used was some of them being more focused on social issues like uh, diversity and inclusion, while other investors... Uh, might be focused more on the environment and, you know, without wanting to stereotype people, you know, there was, there were differences sort of regionally in terms of their uh, focus and attention. Um, Interestingly for me, he framed a lot of the conversation on ESG as a risk management issue and that, you know, when the investors are looking at um, hedge funds, what they're trying to do is is use hedge funds to reduce their exposure to the environmental, social, and cultural issues. And an obvious tool in that arsenal at the disposal of uh, hedge funds is short selling. Now, to me, um, you know, short selling is uh, you know is is something I probably will never be settled, right? And, and Max did point to the fact that there's even still some skepticism in the industry about whether short selling is even compatible with responsible investing. And, and I think that mirrors that wider debate. Uh, the truth is that's probably always going to depend on individual points of view. People have been debating it for 400 years. I keep saying if they've been doing it the last 400 years with a resolution, probably 400 years from now, they'll still be debating it. One of the ex- interesting examples we specifically looked at that Max raised was using uh, alternative funds to manage carbon exposure. And I think that's a, a great example. We also talked about uh, energy companies. Um, the fundamental to all of this, Max made, uh, I think, an excellent point that the real challenge is the absence of sufficient data uh, really to make sort of uh, lasting decisions on sort of ESG and responsible investing uh, points of view. Um, and we also talked about uh, the uh, different regional agendas and, and using Canada as a little microcosm of the dichotomy of issues where you have a country that's really very environmentally aware, but also heavily dependent on harvesting natural resources for their own prosperity. Uh, so we also talked about short selling. Uh, one of the examples Max pointed to was companies that make home insulation as being beneficiaries of kind of the environmental agenda. And and we talked a little bit about sort of long short funds in the alternative space focused on ESG. Um, and look, I, I think it's clear uh, all throughout that these are still early days. Uh, 
And Max encouraged people to reach out to uh, him and Ama. And as I said, my own experience with Max is uh, that he's very approachable. Uh, and accordingly, I've, I've included Max's details in the show notes below. Uh, I'm always learning, and I hope you are as well. Uh, look, I'd like to thank uh, all the listeners that have given us ratings. I really appreciate it. If you like this show, uh, tell all your friends about it. Uh, get them all to subscribe. Uh, leave us a review. That would be great. Uh, I'd really appreciate that. And, and ratings, because that really helps us get more guests. I'm, I'm interested in your feedback always. Uh, did you like this show? Do you want to see more things on the ESG topic, uh, more on short selling uh, or, or something else? Look, I, I think that's probably it. Uh, reach out to me at uh, Roy at PeerPoint.info. That's my uh, my own email. Our, we've got lots of uh, material at www.peerpoint.info. Lots of free stuff on securities lending, short selling, uh, collateral management related areas. Of course, we also have courses. Um, the newest course, uh, we've just launched one on collateral management. Uh, probably... Uh, around the time this show gets uh, published, we'll be releasing one on uh, repo. Uh, so the fundamentals of the repo market. So lots of information for you there. Uh, you can always find us on LinkedIn and Facebook as Pierpoint Financial Consulting and on Twitter at Pierpoint FC. Uh, I'm Roy Zimmerhansel. This has been Pierpoint Perspectives, the art of securities finance. And I look forward to catching you next time.